on, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. Get in the truck. Get in the truck, sissy. Get in the truck. Get in there. Good girl. Chris, let's tell folks why they saw us hightailing it to the truck with the, some of the important things in our lives. Lay out the scenario for us. So on today's video, we're simulating a nuclear attack on America. Uh, specific to us here, a nuclear attack on the naval base in Jacksonville, which is 90 miles that direction, the way the bird flies. So a submarine-based attack, a 50 kiloton warhead, which is about an average size for submarine launched uh, nukes in the Russian Navy. 50, 50 kilotons. 50 kilotons. So yeah. how can you compare that to something people might know the, the uh, reference? Uh, so the bombs we dropped on Japan were around 20 kilotons. Oh, okay. Uh, difference being is that most of the structures in, in Japan that we hit, they, they were literally paper or at least wood. I mean, they're very uh, not significant structures. So a 50 kiloton uh, nuke is pretty small, relatively speaking. I mean, we're, we're looking at probably less than 2,000 immediate casualties in the Jacksonville area, just to give you some size and scale to it. Okay, so we're in Ormond Beach. We're talking about a nuclear strike in Jacksonville. So you can look it up on a map if you wanna make that reference. Let's talk about fallout. Should we be worried down here? Uh, not so much. Our prevailing winds are, are west to east. The only time that really changes is if we have a storm coming up the east coast. Uh, so at altitude, you know, on average, about 15 mile an hour wind blowing from west to east. So uh, we'll throw actually a map up uh, in the video here that'll show the pattern of the fallout, which will essentially be going out to sea. So I'm looking at my map here and I'm looking kind of at the, the seaport. I'm assuming I'll, the sea, I'll see travel out of Jacksonville's probably going to be non-existent at that point, right? Yeah, so hitting the naval base in Jacksonville means all sea traffic in and out of Jacksonville is done. It is shut down. What about EMP blasts, electromagnetic pulse? So, you know, fortunately, we have an in-house uh, subject matter expert when it comes to ordinances. Uh, Mike Sterling, he'll be joining us in this video. And, I, you know, this was new news to me uh, when he told me this, but the blast radius for a nuke actually exceeds typically what the EMP radius is. Oh, no kidding. So we're looking at anything from north of St. Augustine down to here isn't even going to hiccup uh, from the EMP generated by a 50 kiloton warhead. Talking about communications next, let's talk about that, that crucial uh, survival uh, th thing that we need. We need that communication, ham radios and so forth. I know you're, a, you're an enthusiast when it comes to these devices. Yeah, so just to set the stage on this, the, the gist of this is, is that we have a bug out location in the Blue Ridge Mountains, and it, it's pretty important that we get out or dodge as fast as possible. But, you know, we have a whole stockpile of stuff in North Georgia. We have our equipment ready to go. So we've got a 72 hour bag here. We've got another bag here. It's a Faraday bag that's full of electronics, including radios and whatnot. Uh, God forbid, but if we get into a, you know, a shootout at the OK Corral between here and, and the cabin, we've got plate carriers, we've got level 3A, we've got level 3, we've got level 4 plates. We've got several self-defense tools uh, on our person and in the vehicle as well. Yeah, which we're not going to show because uh, YouTube will slap us down for that. Um, we brought a power station with us, but we have plenty of power at our destination as well. We've got solar panels and whole home uh, power backups there. We grabbed our Duration Health antibiotic kit. That also has additional stuff in it, uh, like iodine, in case we do happen to be exposed. We probably won't be. And uh, most importantly, we brought the moon floss over there behind you, Denny. <laughs> yeah, important. Hey, important stuff, guys. You need to think about this stuff. Obviously, we also have hydration. We've got food in the vehicle. Uh, and, you know, we're going to talk about some of the intricacies on those uh, topics. If we get hit once, we're probably getting hit. There's more coming. More. There's more yeah, coming. There's more coming. Uh, Mike Sterling will make the distinction that, you know, uh, our DOD, it's basically they've always preached all or nothing when it's nuclear war. The Russians, on the other hand, have tactical nukes, small enough that they will only take out, say, 10 square blocks in a city. But based on what we know from, you know, the limited information that we get access to from the Department of Defense, uh, if we get hit once, 
we're going to counterattack, which means they're going to counterattack. Now, whether that escalates to Armageddon or not remains to be seen. But if there's been one nuclear bomb going off, there's going to be multiple ones falling, whether they're tactical in nature or it's Armageddon. This is, this is a catastrophic event. This is an SHTF uh, apocalyptic po possible in the world type event. Ter the, the worst of the worst scenarios. The entire eastern seaboard probably going to be shut down, clogged up. Uh, really, really difficult to travel. But we don't want to stay here. No, we absolutely don't want to stay here because we know that, uh, you know, Orlando, which is much closer than Jacksonville, is a highly strategic target. And so we'll be impacted even more if something happens there. You know, there's that initial period of time when people, you know, won't fully grasp the gravity of the situation. So that's why we ran like heck out of the front door. We had our stuff ready to go. We've got emergency preparedness kits in both of our trucks, your truck, as well as our truck, you know. Always. So we're going to take both vehicles. And, uh, you know, we're always full on fuel. But we're getting the heck out of here, and we're not going up I-95. We're That's going right. to take back roads. That's right. We're going to avoid certain areas. What, what would, should we avoid, obviously? Well, first and foremost, you want to avoid any strategic targets. You know, you don't want to be anywhere near any bases, number one. Number two, you don't want to be near any large urban center because it'll be absolute gridlock once people clue into what's going on. So that's why it's so important for us to just get out of here ASAP. That's right. We're going to follow our map. We're going to travel the back roads, right, uh, on our pre-planned evacuation route. And uh, we're going to talk more about that. Right on. Okay, Mike, so we've laid the context of this simulation. Uh, I'd like to get you to weigh in now and qualify some of the stuff that we, we put out there in the introduction of this video. All right, so I designed this attack for you uh, from the red side, uh, specifically aimed at... Uh, at this target here in the Jacksonville area, we originally wanted to go for the airport, but uh, if you can attack, uh, if you can attack NAS Mayport, that's going to that's going to completely shut this site down. Also, it's a military target, and of course, your tier one, your tier one targets are going to be are going to be strategic, military, and um, and political targets. But then after that, you're going to have your tier two targets, which are going to be non-strategic military. But um, I mean, uh, NAS Mayport is still is still a pretty solid target. Also, um, defining this target, you're going to shut down that that entrance to the sea uh, from Jacksonville for a while. Um, it's not permanent, but you were you, you're going to clog that with a, with a lot of wreckage, and it's going to be a you know, radioactive mess. So, um, now as far as the weapon is concerned, we targeted that with a uh, with a, a, a submarine launch caliber cruise missile. It's an appropriate weapon uh, for for that type of a target. They could have also used a submarine launch ballistic missile, but in this case, I just felt like using a cruise missile. Um, Fifty kiloton nuclear warhead is approximately the appropriate size for one of those. It could be fifty to one hundred kilotons, um, which you know they're not huge, but they do a good job. Uh, we went ahead and went with a ground level uh, burst. Uh, so I think the burst that we had on there was, I want to say, like something like 100 feet off off the deck, something like that. So it carves out a nice, healthy crater. I mean, nobody's ever going to use that place as an airbase again. That's just never going to happen. Um, so uh, the the prevailing winds give you a, a wonderful option for you guys just because all of the fallout, which ground burst nuclear uh uh, nuclear detonations they're what produce fallout so uh but with the prevailing winds all of your all of your fallout predominantly is going out to sea which is a good thing now you're going to get localized little bits of it but not a whole heck of a lot uh just the the 95 percent of it is headed east with the prevailing winds and that's a beautiful okay. thing as far as emp effects your primary emp effects for a for a terrestrial nuclear device are actually predominant the the hard emp is smaller than your blast radius uh like like you had discussed previously and that's a that's a good thing now you're going to get you're going to get um a reducing effect coming out of there and like like i had told you previously that it anything anything down 
maybe to St. Augustine is going to see an effect, but the vast majority of that stuff, you're going to be able to just turn it off and turn it right back on again. Uh, cell phones may see some, may see, you know, you may get 50% of them out there that will shut off and be done for good. That's within that area. So the, the city of Jacksonville, you're going to get some, you're going to get some interesting effect, but a lot of things like, like, you know, if you've got a digital wristwatch, it's not going to see any, any kind of, a, of an effect out there. Um, handheld radios things like that you may be able to just turn them off turn it right back on again they, they may be just fine yeah so where we are this this far south likelihood you're, of emp fallout not too much now nah, your 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 emp effect down there is you're going to see it you're going to see you know a momentary disruption of, of electronics and then it's going to be back up again so while we were offline uh we were discussing high value targets in the state of florida and so you voiced your opinion, uh, rightfully so, that Tampa was more of a strategic target than Orlando. Can you explain that part? Right. So Orlando, Orlando has no military uh, installations. Now it's a, it is a, uh, uh, it is a communications center for Florida, but it's more of a population hub than anything else. So predominantly, Orlando, Orlando qualifies as a tier four target, whereas Tampa, you've got some pretty serious stuff. I mean, you've got the, you've got the primary. Uh, central command based out of there so tampa if if you're going to hit someplace tampa is going to catch a nuke uh so your your bailout your bailout uh bugging out of the area is is a good call because it's gonna if as soon as tampa gets hit and tampa will more than likely be one of those places that catches several mervs off of a uh uh, off of a submarine launch ballistic missile. And when that happens, you're going to blanket the entirety of the center of that state in fallout. Mm. It's, it's going to be bad. So yes, bugging out North is, is that is definitely the way to go. As far as future weapons, you're absolutely right. If you're going to get hit once, you're going to, you may as well assume you're going to get hit twice. So having, having some of your electronics uh like there on your on your your plate carriers um yeah that's you know having a having a handheld radio there and stuff is fine i leave absolutely everything else inside that bag all right keep all your stuff shielded as long as you can uh because more are going to be coming so uh, during your bug out, you know, if you have, say, uh, a pair of sacrificial handheld radios that you don't mind, you know, not your your five hundred dollar or, mm. or or fifteen hundred dollar Motorola's, but you know, throw a couple of twenty five dollar Bayfongs on those suckers, and that's enough to that's enough to get you out of there. You know, a week later, okay, now we'll put the good ones on there. So but. That's a really interesting comment on your part because uh, when Denny and I. Uh, shot all of the outdoor content for this video earlier we specifically mentioned that we had multiple ham radios in our faraday bag and that we had taken one out and one out only because of that that the prospect of that happening and that we had half a dozen of them in the bag charged up with extra batteries with the charger and protected um actually Absolutely. inside of you know two faraday bags to be more right accurate. right okay all right, Mike. So uh, at this point, appreciate you qualifying, you know, the the gravity of the situation in this simulation. Uh, so we'll get back to the content and then uh, we'll see you at the end of the video uh, to wrap up for a conclusion. Can't wait. All right, Chris. Now we're really talking about who, what, where, how, all the all the nitty gritty stuff. Uh, so who is traveling? Uh, so two vehicles. So you and your fur babies and Cindy and I and our fur babies and two separate vehicles. You know, that's just a great plan because uh, with two vehicles, you have an automatic backup plan with another vehicle that's able to travel if something happens, right? Yeah. We can hear vehicles passing by us right now. Very important for people to remember, if you do have access to multiple vehicles, it just really becomes a force multiplier for you, doesn't it? Absolutely. Okay, let's talk about nitty gritties of what we're taking, a 72 hour bag and what needs to be in that bag. Well, so we've reviewed this 72 hour bag and then we we re-engineered it with the uh, stuff that we want. So if we did have to bail out of a vehicle, we've got shelter in there. We've got more than 72 hours worth of food. We've got navigation tools. Uh, we've got pretty much everything you can imagine, extra socks, extra clothes, a pretty robust first aid kit, and the list goes on and on. Speaking of first aid, iodine 127. What is it and what's the importance of it? 
Yeah, so your thyroid's a giant iodine sponge. And if your iodine meter isn't all the way to the top and you get exposed to radioactive stuff, so that's all the iodines that are up in the 130s, uh, your body will absorb that. And now you've absorbed radioactive uh, you know, stuff. So if you take iodine-127 tablets and you keep the tank at full, you can be exposed to the you know radioactive iodine, but your body won't absorb it because it's got a full tank. So discussing potassium iodide, um, a potassium iodine is a counter to radioactive iodine settling in your uh, in your thyroid. We're talking about iodine 131, 132, 34, and 35. These are all particulate uh, material about the size, uh, they're little grains about the size of um, talcum powder. However, um, a so a, a nuclear device produces some of this, but only in extremely small quantities. The vast majority of radioactive iodine that you're going to find comes from faded giant events, which is a meltdown of a nuclear reactor. Okay. So that's that's the primary place where you're going to find large quantities of that. So save your uh, save your potassium iodide for for one of those type of, of events. You're not going to get enough of this in and if especially as far away as you are. Go ahead and save it. So essentially, we'd have to be in close proximity to a nuclear uh, power plant that was struck with a nuclear missile. <laughs> in this case. Yeah, right. <laughs> Man, that would be pretty bad luck, wouldn't it? That would not be good. That would not be good. Yeah. <laughs> We review a lot of portable power stations on Survival Dispatch. We've got one there now, but we suggest also adding solar panels, right? Absolutely. Yep. We've got a couple solar panels in our um, emergency preparedness truck kits. And this is just one of uh, two power stations that we're taking with us. What's the importance of sunglasses? Yeah. Well, I mean, God forbid that we're anywhere near one of these nuclear blasts, but the intensity of the light is so significant that if you're in close proximity, you can actually scorch your retinas. Right. Regarding sunglasses versus a, nu versus a nuclear flash, uh, unless you're wearing welding goggles, I wouldn't look at uh, a nuclear detonation. However, sunglasses are going to help you for the rest of your uh, the, the rest of your eyesight, primarily for reflections. And because we live in an urban world, there are lots of reflections from glass. So you can you can still be blinded. Um, or ev even temporarily dazzled by a large flash coming uh, from from a weapon that you're not even looking at, just reflecting off of glass. Holy cows. So, you know, for argument's sake, if, if everything was lined up properly and it hit one of your side mirrors in your vehicle and you just so happen to be looking there, it could get you in that case. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. Learn something new every day. You know, you and I uh, have a very good habit of keeping our vehicles fueled up at all times. I highly recommend everybody do that. But, you know, we might not be able to make it there on a full tank of gas. Explain that scenario. Well, as long as we don't get too far off the beaten path, both vehicles will be able to get to our bug out location in North Georgia in the Blue Ridge Mountains. But we do have extra jerry cans with extra fuel with us, just in case. Yeah, I always carry extra fuel as well. If by chance we have to stop and get fuel or have to make a purchase along the way, we were talking earlier about the importance of having cash money. Yeah, cash, but a small amount stored in different places just in case we get into some sort of you know, carjacking, robbery type scenario. Uh, we want to make sure that some of it's hidden. So, Right. Now, our location, our destination is uh, the remote cabin in the Blue Ridge Mountains in North Georgia. Regardless of where your bug out location is, let's talk about the importance of being stocked with food, water, tools, and other necessities. Yeah, I mean, under normal circumstances, it's approximately an eight-hour drive from here to there, but we're going to be taking back roads. There's the potential that we're going to be hitting some congestion, even though we're going nowhere near any large cities. Uh, so it's important that we have enough su to sustain us to get there, um, as well as the fact that, you know, we want to make sure that if, if we end up getting stopped along the way, worst case scenario, if we have to go on foot, we have what we need in that case as well. All right, so Chris, I've got this EMP shield. We talked about it earlier. What is it and what's the importance of having one of these devices? 
Uh, so this device from EMP Shield uh, protects your vehicle uh, from CMEs and EMPs, not if you're ground zero, of course. Uh, but it's essentially a shunt. You know, electricity is always looking for its quickest pathway to ground. So this reroutes the electricity away from the electrical system of your vehicle in less than 500 trillionths of a second. It's passed uh, half a dozen different DOD specifications for EMP. Uh, can we prove that it works? No, but we kind of have to rely on the laboratories that have said it has passed. Either way, it's better than nothing. You know, I, I, this is the new generation. We have them on all our vehicles. I think it's like four, 450 bucks. The yeah. old one was bigger and I remember bulkier. it's under 500 bucks. Yeah, yeah. The, the older one's a little bigger and bulkier. I think you can get them for somewhere in the 300s now. And you can get them for your houses as well. Yeah, yeah. Our houses are protected with these as well. But specific to this video, since we're bugging out in a vehicle, you know, and again, we're far enough away that we're not being impacted by that EMP. But if we're on our way to North Georgia and let's say something does go off in proximity to us and it takes out everybody else's vehicle, uh, knock on wood, hopefully this device lives up to its billing and keeps us trucking on down the road. All right, girl. Be thankful you're not fat like your brother. He'd be way too hot. That's why he's not out here right now with us. All right? You need to go inside and get some water. You sick of this pretend bugging out stuff? Hmm? Just a quick aside, uh, if you're storing your radios in Faraday bags or not, hopefully you are, take the antennas off. Anything with an antenna is gonna be uh, more exposed to an EMP strike. Specific to this uh, folding antenna, uh, we've shown it many times before. Somebody made a comment that it's too heavy. This thing can't weigh more than a couple ounces. It is not heavy. Uh, it's not too bulky. It actually comes with straps where we can fold it up multiple times and put a strap around it. But the benefits of this type of antenna is significant when you're interstating it and you're trying to extend your range in particular. So Chris, FEMA has certain recommendations that we are not gonna follow. <laughs> what, is, what is, explain that please. Yeah, FEMA's recommendation is, is to shelter in place. Kind of like that malarkey that happened a couple of years ago with the uh, the fake uh, emergency that was going on. Yeah, so FEMA FEMA says uh, stay in, get inside, stay inside, and wait for further instructions. We're not doing that. We're hightailing it north. We're going to our uh, bug out location. Um, it's imperative to get out as fast as you can. What? Why is that? Well, I mean, let's be clear. This is a, a simulation of a nuclear you know, Tiwataki event, SHTF event, however you want to put it, being anywhere near an urban center is not a great place to be. Uh, even if the area doesn't get attacked, uh, at some point in time, you're going to need additional resources and people will literally be killing each other for food. You know, we're never more than three meals away from absolute anarchy, three missed meals away. Um, and in this particular case, we have a bug out location. We have multiple routes to get there on back roads from here. Uh, so we don't want to be anywhere near a heavily populated area. Right. And uh, we're not wasting any time. We're not stopping to make phone calls. We can call family on the, on the road. Yeah, exactly. Uh, we're fueled up. I keep my vehicle full all the time. I mean, I'm barely, I barely ever get past a quarter of a gallon. I have extra fuel in the back. I know you carry extra fuel as well. So we're uh, showing our age here because I think we already mentioned that in this video. <laughs> Probably so. It's, it's that sometimers thing, here, right? Here, sometimes we remember, sometimes we forget. Some, uh, here's some more old man advice for you. Stay up on your oil changes <laughs> and your maintenance of your vehicle, your tire pressure, all those important things. Because you never know when the SHT is going to F, hit the F, <laughs> yeah, boy, and you got to get the heck out of Dodge. So a situation is like this is why you should always maintain your vehicle uh, to the highest standards. And by the way, if there's more than one person in a vehicle, we're going to trade off on driving, right? Yeah, absolutely. The idea is to get to our bug out location as fast and safely as possible and not end up getting there and be completely bagged out. You know, we want to still have some some energy because we now know that we're in a nuclear war with a foreign entity, possibly more than one. We, we've we've got a heck of a stockpile at our bug out location, uh, but there's work to be done. And I'm assuming she's not allowed to drive. Yeah, well, <laughs> she's not old enough yet. She's got another eight years to go before she can get her driver's license. <laughs> Chris, just a few uh, more 
important travel notes that we should talk about. And one of which extremely important is information and how to continue to digest that information and the different sources of information that you're going to be monitoring that we're going to be listening to and watching while we travel. As long as the network's up, we're going to be using our smartphones to gather as much intel as we possibly can. Uh, we've got a handful of ham radios. We have one out at a time, the rest stay in Faraday bags. So if there's a subsequent EMP strike that we're in closer proximity to, it doesn't nuke all of our EMP radios. We've got these little two-way radios as well, uh, one in each vehicle, uh, so we can stay in touch with each other along the way. Uh, communications is kind of a crapshoot when you're in a nuclear SHTF uh, scenario. And we probably mentioned this before, we really don't want to stop. We think we have enough fuel to go all the way, but you know, don't, don't stop for your safety and, and your security, right? And I mean, barring getting way off the beaten path, we have more than enough fuel in both vehicles to do this without stopping. Of course, we have extra fuel as well, but we don't want to go to gas stations. Uh, they're a dangerous place at the best of times, and they're only going to be worse in this type of scenario. Uh, we want to stay away from urban centers. We want to stay away from people in general um, and keep as low a profile as we possibly can. Yeah, and we're not going to stop for bathroom breaks. Just take care of business. I'm probably not going to pee in my battle bottle if I can help it. That would be sacrilegious. But I'm not going to stop. That's correct. <laughs> Okay, Mike, so we're at the end of uh, this video. You've had a chance to see the theoretical plans that Denny and I laid out. Uh, this is more in your wheelhouse than it is in ours. I'd like to hear your uh, critiques of what we put together, optimizations, things we missed. We want to hear that from everybody actually down in the comments, but especially want to hear your opinion since you're a subject matter expert in this stuff. So fire away. So, um, yeah, my former students always define me as an absolute bastard uh, <laughs> when it came to evaluations because, um, yeah, I, I'm that guy. Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to be nice. So uh, let's talk about a couple of things that, uh, that you guys do have going on. One, first of all, your speed of departure. That's key. That's going to get you out in front of a lot of things. Not only is it going to get you out of uh, it's it's not only going to get you out ahead of a lot of other people in northern Florida that are going to be trying to also displace, but it's going to uh, then you're you're also going to uh, not have to deal with a bunch of relief convoys coming in, right? Right. which there inevitably will be, and sometimes they'll wind up closing those roads down. Also, it's probably going to get you uh, out ahead of a lot of road closure. So that general area is going to wind up getting closed down. One of the reasons that they're going to wind up closing a lot of those roads down, and the state of Georgia themselves may just plain close their border. They're going to want to close that area down because they're not going to want to have people that were in the inf uh, affected area bringing radioactive contamination down the road you know 50 100 miles outside of the outside of the area you guys are not in a contaminated position but other people could be and that's one of the primary reasons for going on ahead and holding those people where they are because we got to get them decontaminated before we get them out of there uh, that's a super interesting comment on your part uh, for those people who aren't familiar with the state of georgia um they have uh, gates on uh the entrance and exits you know from all of their interstates even some state roads as well. So even if they haven't dispatched, say, a trooper to man a road blockade, they have the ability to drop the boom and, you know, put some obstructions in place. We don't have anything like that in Florida. So that's really interesting. So if we leave early, hopefully we can get across and we're going by back roads as well. We're not taking the interstate. Right. So yeah. they'll they'll shut down the interstates first because that's what they have the manpower to do so anything beyond that is going to wind up being the national guard is going to wind up having to come in and you're looking at about uh 18 to 24 hours to be able to get an effective response out of the guard okay uh on that kind of a thing so you guys are out ahead of it stay ahead of it. you guys are you guys are transiting non-refugee lines of drift refugee lines of drift are going to wind up being i-75 i-85 or, or sorry 75 95. 95 because 85 is didn't start till atlanta um <clears throat> But yeah, staying off of those, that's where the vast majority of the traffic is going to wind up being. That's where the vast, where the vast majority of your troublers are going to wind up being. Mm -hmm. So uh, avoiding that, that's a big thing. Now, um, 
that is going to that is going to extend out uh, the mileage that you're going to wind up putting in. You're not going to get highway mileage because you're not doing just straight shots. So, how many miles is it approximately to your uh, to your your destination? Yeah, taking back roads, five hundred twenty five hundred thirty miles. Okay, so we're looking at about five hundred and well, actually, we're what we're really looking at there is is closer to, with with detours and everything like that. We're looking at closer to six hundred and fifty miles. Okay. Um, now, what is your um, uh, what is your your fuel capacity on those vehicles? It's approximately that distance, is it not? Yeah, at thirty two gallons, uh, nineteen twenty miles a gallon in a highway scenario. Mm -hmm. So you're also going to wind up doing, you're going to be stopping at a lot of stop signs in little towns. You're going to be, you know, stop signs, stop lights. You're going to be behind other people that are going to be driving at different speeds, a lot of stop, go, stuff like that. Things that are going to really mess with your, with your vehicle mileage. Okay. So you have to plan that you're going to wind up consuming more gas. Now you may not. All right. But you have to assume that you're going to consume more fuel in this in this trip than you would how much how much additional fuel do you carry so our contingency was 10 gallons for each vehicle okay at the bare minimum in a situation like that you should be carrying 20 gallons even if you have okay. to take an extra 10 seconds or you know an extra two minutes grab it out of your garage throw it into the back of your truck all right minimum of 20 gallons uh, like we wouldn't go anywhere in afghanistan or anything like that which is you know pretty similar environment to what we're going to be doing here without a spare 20 gallons of fuel all right. Okay. The next question is, um, you have to assume that you're going to have you're going to have flat tires either by debris on the roads or car wrecks or um, um, or or you know even if it's just you know I hate to say it somebody shooting at you right. Mm -hmm. um, so how many tires are on your vehicle? Four. Am I correct? Yes. And how many spare tires do you have? One for each. You have one one spare tire for each vehicle you must assume if you're going to wind up getting into one of these situations you're going to wind up losing both tires on one side you never tra you never travel in a situation like this with only one spare tire you always travel with 50 percent of whatever tires that you have on your vehicle so you need two spare tires on those vehicles even you're if you've got to grab it for spare you're the first person that, that I've ever heard suggest that. I'm I'm sure there's videos out there or somebody else, but that's the first time I've ever personally heard that. Yeah, you'll you'll never hate life more than being in an eight-wheeled armored vehicle and somebody lights you up from one side, really, really heavy, and all four tires on one side go Shh. dang. Yeah. Now you're all sitting there going, This is going to suck a lot. And guess what? I'll bet you probably don't have run flats on those things so no, don't. you're gonna need something to be able to to work on that so patch kits are a great thing if you can patch it okay you may not be able to patch it you may have to swap it out okay yeah. honestly you guys have got a good solid plan you're 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 good you're clean you're keeping a lot of your your additional com communications gear uh that is potentially fragile you're keeping it in in there now one of the other questions that i did have for you is do you have waypoints along your route that if you get separated you can meet at your next waypoint we did not uh consider that yeah you should put those you should put those in approximately every 50 to 100 miles just so or or you know give or take just so that they're you know okay we're coming up on alpha okay we're coming up on bravo hey we're getting separated i've still got radio communications with you meet me at charlie okay okay That's, things like that yeah what a great point thank you yeah Con you should you need to have contingencies on your contingencies upon your contingencies you guys um, have got a good solid plan um it just needs fleshed out a little bit is all um <clears throat> and honestly, I wind up doing this stuff too. Map out your map out, and and if and and this is for this is for the viewers. If you have the opportunity to look at your bug out routes, look at the alternate roads around them in case you wind up having to detour around something, a detour around a town. Yeah, actually so that, drive those routes. That's a great point. Um, we have three uh, routes. We've got the one that we're most familiar with, traveling back roads. We do have two more that we have driven uh those roads before but we're not quite as familiar with them just in case we have to you know adjust our course right and i've got those uh, i've got the same thing with a couple of my uh my routes and we usually color the routes so each each route will be you know red blue gold 
whatever. Nice. And then you'll have you'll have your waypoints along the along the way. So you've got red one, red two, red three, gold four, stuff like that. Um, okay. And of course, they're going to wind up they're going to wind up coming up coming together at certain points. It just happens that way. So one other thing that I did want to address. Um, because we did not discuss it previously and there is a there is a huge difference between a between the very small emp effects from a uh from a ground burst nuclear device like this to a hemp which is a high altitude emp device which is the strategic emp type uh effect weapon um and i haven't i haven't discussed it previously it is there is a huge difference between the two um the the problem with a lot of the data that's out there is a lot of people wind up going back for their research to that paper that went to congress that freaked everybody out well it was particularly meant to freak everybody out and it's the same data that fortune went with and and believe me you know um the one point safe book is a is a great drama terrible science Okay. The problem with that with that document is that that document was specifically meant to shock people. The science that was added onto it was over twenty years old, and and it was literally that was the purpose of it was to shock Congress into action by them not looking to you know a, a different scientific advisor. So just just for our viewers' uh, benefit, we're discussing a, a paper that was presented to Congress in the early 2000s, while we were still, you know, suffering from uh, 9/11 PTSD, and uh, there was a lot of hyperbole in that report, as you've said. Uh, but to this day, there are people, uh, you know, that comment on stuff on the internet and whatnot, who are referring back either directly or indirectly to that report which is full of a lot of baloney. Well, it's it's not necessarily baloney. I mean at the time at the time that it was that it was uh that it was written or for I should say at the time that that a lot of the paperwork uh or the science that uh they used was written, which a lot of that science was honestly from the mid to late 80s, it was correct. But the problem was uh, there was a huge quantity of research and development that was that was purported during the 90s on that and we know better now. So the the well, the deal well, that's oh, my point though that's why i said baloney right. that's what i mean right is right that right they purposely used data to support a narrative mm -hmm. that they wanted to get out there when there was alternative data that you know right. uh far more what, yeah far more contemporary right information right yeah let's talk about high altitude emp um the uh the the threshold for those you're talking 100 to 200,000 feet agl where they where they pop those things we're talking you know we're talking high atmospheric here um the bare minimum threshold for a weapon of that type is 1.18 megatons okay right not kilotons we're talking about megatons here and a megaton device of that size is heavy so at this point there's only three possibly four countries that can do that okay very few people uh there are very few countries that are in the nuclear club have breached the megaton club okay and once you once it, you get over it, 300 kilotons of a device man the weight really starts going up so when you say you know just a handful it, you mean as far as the ability uh to put a large <laughs> nuclear warhead on a missile is that what you're referring to no, actually, what I'm referring to is the miniaturization of a warhead to that point. Okay. Okay. So the the deal, it, the the big milestone with nuclear weapons is not is not how big of a bomb you can make. Anybody can friggin' build a huge huge bomb, put it inside of a forty foot container. Now the the real milestone is miniaturization. The smaller and lighter that you can get it the better off so but once you broach over 300 kilotons that's when you start having to add on additional things onto the design and construction of these things and those things weigh and you make it bigger and those things weigh more and we're talking about a lot we're talking about very heavy stuff here so uh you have to get first you have to get that warhead to that altitude then that warhead has to be of sufficient yield 
to be able to do that. Um, when you have a, a, a weapon of that magnitude detonate at those, you know, within that envelope there, right? Um, so if you look at the science from from the from the letter from Congress, basically it just says shows these big platters slapped down over North America, and it's like, okay, everything in this circle, EMP has destroyed all those things. And that's just not true. Um, you have you're going to have an area of highest effect, and you know in in that scenario, you'd actually be looking at like what was it? It was four devices that were popped over North America, something like that in the, in, in one point safe. And I'm only using that as a, as a common reference for everybody. Uh, Cause virtually everybody out there has read that book. So uh, if you're looking at like four devices, so basically what you would have is you had to have four generally dead spots, a little bit smaller than the size of Georgia, okay. right? Where absolutely everything electronic, boop, congratulations, you're in the stone age. All right. But you're going to have an, a, a, area of lessening effect going out from that all right so you're going to have areas where that wouldn't be affected at all and then you're going to have areas that okay they may be affected a little bit you know the areas that are close by okay all the radios and all the cell phones and everything like that okay that's all gone your digital watch running like a tarp okay no problems so high altitude emp is is a very fickle thing there's a lot of science behind it. it is not a small thing all right i don't even understand it fully and i've i've sat through several scientific lectures specifically on it um so but the theoretically, theoretically. You know, it, to achieve uh you know complete annihilation of our electric grid and all electronic devices <clears throat> that aren't protected i'm just doing the math in my head probably somewhere around 250 high altitude nukes it's going to be a bunch of them it's going to be right. a whole lot because you got to take us mexico canada um you right. know in, yeah i and mean i was just i was just doing the math in my head for lower 48 i wasn't even yeah. taking into account canada and mexico yeah i mean it's it's a lot of warheads it's a okay. lot of warheads and they're big warheads so everybody that says oh the north koreans may have one on a satellite man their satellites weigh less than 100 pounds no. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm going to very quickly, uh, you know, um, take us down another rabbit hole here. <clears throat> Is there um, any truth to the fact that the Russians are arming uh, their ICBMs, nuclear ICBMs with a dead man switch so that, you know, no matter what happens, the thing is going to detonate? That's the uh, they they call that the 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 doomsday device, right? Um, and that goes back to they named it actually they named it after the concept that uh, came out of the movie Doctor Strangelove. No kidding. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's I'm talking some about for you. Yeah, I'm talking. I'm telling you. Talk about uh, talk about life imitating fiction. Um, no, nobody's going to do that. That that's okay. just it's ridiculous. Now, I mean, of course, I don't have I don't have clearances for that kind of stuff anymore. I mean, I suppose you could do it. Why? I mean, are you going to put it all in, in control of a machine? You know, I mean, we we talked about, and you know, I mean, we, that was the the fallacy of that was shown. You know, not only in Doctor Strangelove, which, good lord, that's a that's an old movie. Yeah. Um, but look at War Games. You know, from the eighties, it's in there. That's a pretty damn good reason to not do that sort of thing. So, yeah, the 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 electronic fail safe doomsday switch. I don't know, man. I wouldn't. I I wouldn't put a whole lot of credence behind okay. that. That that smells an awful lot like like BS to me. Like um, du like double O seven stuff. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. Got it. So now there's going to be a lot of people that are not going to like what I got to say about that about that that this this hemp stuff okay a lot of people are not going to like that because this is going to fly in the face of a lot of dogma that you got that the prepper community has lived for a very long time okay I, you know what that's just fine if you don't like what i've got to say put your comments down below show your science okay i could pull my science uh or or even you know Put up a video that counters this and and says, "Hey, you're wrong, and here's why you're wrong." Okay, but let us know. Okay, if 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 you think that I'm wrong, uh, show your show your work. Okay, yeah, show your work. 
that's kind of like the uh, the famous grand thumb line. You know, things are out of control down there in the comment section. Get in there, mix it up. <laughs> you know, right? <laughs> <laughs> Tell us why we're wrong. <laughs> I'm telling you, I, I'm Scottish and Jewish. I'll fight over anything, man. <laughs> T- tell me i'm wrong then prove it okay right. so but it's but emp is not the huge boogeyman that everybody freaks out that it is all right okay. now now granted your your power lines and everything like that man those are going to get all kinds of screwed up the, the power grid is just gonna is will just get screwed up because yes all those power lines are big antennas and they carry that with them for a long ways but that is electrical also remember that that system that that's going to burn out fairly quickly just because of transformers. Transformers burn out; they can't continue to transmit the, yeah, power. Con- continuity is going right. Continuity is going to wind up burning out. That and also you're looking at massive quantities of juice. It, it's it's one of those situations of take, uh, you know, it's it's honestly it's tantamount to taking a piece of steel wool and sticking a, a nine volt battery into it. Look at how fast that wire burns up. Right. It's going to burn up pretty quick. Look at the, okay. If you look at the one Carrington effect, uh, event yeah. uh, that was uh, um, uh, from the 1800s, uh, you know, large quantities of telegraph wire burned up in the process of that. It, it The bottom line is we just don't, everything that we have is theoretical at this point, nonetheless. Okay. We've done, we've done some testing. We've done some modeling and things like that on a, on a huge Carrington event type, type thing. But for EMP, EMP is a lot more manageable. We have a lot of data on that. Okay. So, um, well, and theoretically uh, what I've read is that we're kind of due for another Carrington level event. Uh, I, again, can't speak to the veracity of that, right. but uh, nor can I, it's entirely possible it could happen in our lifetime. Let's leave it at that. Yeah, it's possible. Yeah. Yeah. Who knows? Who knows what the sun's going to do? We're, right. we're little itty bitty tiny specks floating around on a rock that is also itty bitty floating around in a great big giant galaxy. Right. World's going to keep on spinning without us, kids. It doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's too funny. Well, uh, listen, Mike, look, I really appreciate your uh, laying out the scenario for us before we started recording, uh, before Denny and I started recording. Um, and as per usual, uh, your critiques are, are awesome stuff that somebody like me uh, didn't consider or think of. And uh, we also here at the tail end got a, quite an education on EMP, high altitude EMP, what it really looks like if we were get you know going to get hit with this stuff. Uh, it's really valuable information. Just want to remind our viewers one more time, if you disagree with Mike, disagree with me, disagree with Denny, tell us why you disagree and back it up in the comments down below. It actually helps us. Even if you disagree with us, it still helps. YouTube uh, sees that as more engagement and they're more likely to recommend our videos. You know, we didn't show any guns in this video, even though obviously we would have self-defense uh, tools at our disposal on a bug out like this. Uh, because we already suffer a fair bit of suppression. We've got over 1,200 videos, approximately 20% of them are gun-related. We've been tapering that off uh, to try and bolster our views, uh, and it's working, you know, slowly but surely. Uh, but other than that, have you got any closing comments, Mike? Um, I know that I would very much like to actually do a live exercise on this with you guys at some point. So that I can throw, uh, so that I can throw some bad things in front of you and see how you guys work with it. And I, and and for the viewers, you know, if if uh, if if you're not practicing these things with an outside entity uh, validating your your work, are you really are are you really practicing your bug outs? Right. If you actually need, if you've got a, a direction that you need to bug out, you need to have somebody from the outside looking at your at your options. All right. Or or you know, looking at your plans and shooting holes in them. All right. Because so, if you find yourself as the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. Amen to that. Uh, that kind of uh, delves into you know what I say frequently have been for years is you need to practice the way that you play and. I'm not going to go too far down this rabbit hole, but uh, we've got a really good uh, relationship with a very famous individual named Tony Blauer. And he uh, 
trains people at the highest levels all the way down to common folk uh, on how to diffuse uh, potentially confrontational situations. And if you can't diffuse it, how to handle it, those sort of things. I said the words muscle memory to him in regards to doing some training, like uh, dry fire training, right? Yeah, great catch, Mike. He said to me, he said, there's no such thing as muscle memory. And let me tell you why. He said, imagine that I cut your arm off that was holding your pistol. And now your, your arm and the pistol are sitting on the table in front, front of you. Can you, that arm pull the trigger on the gun? And I said, well, of course not. And he said, well, that's because there's no such thing as muscle memory. But what there is are developing neural pathways from repeating things over and over again because the body does what the mind tells it be, to do. Pardon me. So we've got some really awesome stuff coming up with Tony Blauer. Uh, you know, in the near future, he's going to be appearing on a bunch of shows. He's given us uh, the opportunity to republish a bunch of his material. I spent two and a half hours on a Zoom with him last night and got an education like uh, I could have never imagined. So anyway. Uh, it's called neurological memory, not muscle memory. There you go. There you go. So listen, Mike, I appreciate all your contributions uh, to Survival Dispatch. Uh, you're an absolute godsend when it comes to this stuff. We greatly appreciate your input. And uh, thank you to everybody out there in Survival Dispatch land for following us. We'll catch you on the next one. Stay safe out there.